Good morning, Twitch. All right, hopefully we're up and running now. Just checking audio here, if anybody can hear me. I can't seem to hear myself. Okay, that should do it. Testing, testing, one, two, three. All right. Sorry for that little delay. Uh, welcome to a morning play test of How to Host a Dungeon. My name is Tony Dowler, and this is How to Host a Dungeon. How to Host a Dungeon is my solo dungeon drawing game in which we create a dungeon from the dawn of the world through the rise and fall of civilizations, inhabited by monsters, uh, perhaps through to the end of the world. So today I actually got started a little bit early and I created uh, this world. Uh, how to host a dungeon has a set of rules where you randomly create a world for your dungeon to grow in. And I'll just kind of tell you about this world that I've created here today. So we've got, this is the surface. We've got a volcano over here and a giant magma chamber deep beneath the earth. We've got these uh, gemstone deposits that have been ejected from the volcano. Some caverns underground and some forests above ground, an additional magma cave off to the side, a vein of silver ore, and this massive buried skull, which I don't have an explanation for. Sometimes the rules just randomly generate weird stuff and you have to kind of figure out what it means. And finally there's an underground river that kind of flows through the middle of the whole thing. So this is the world in which we're going to create uh, first a civilization. So I think today I'm going to do a magician civilization. Uh, the game currently has uh, rules for magician civilizations, dwarf civilizations, and demon civilizations. Uh, the deep elf civilization is mostly done, but needs a little bit of tweaking. I was hoping to get that tweaked so I could do it today, but maybe next week we'll have that ready for a test. So let's get started. Oh, and by the way, I should say, you can find How to Host a Dungeon on Etsy at my website, TonyDollar.com, and you can also find my games and drawings at Patreon.com slash TonyDollar. All right. And let us begin. Um, the Magicians, also known variously as the Wizards, the Sages, and the Hermetics, are a surface-dwelling civilization whose works are doomed to be buried in a great cataclysm. At the beginning of the wizard civilization, we start with a wizard's tower. So let's draw that now. Um, I think I'm going to use uh, purple as my wizard's civilization color. And let's just put a tower right in the middle of this, this forest here. I'm even going to label this one since the first, the wizard's tower. 
how to host a dungeon as a drawing game, of course you can draw the things any way you want. Um, I like to add little frills like this tower roof and a window and some bricks, but you can do things as simply or as complicated as you want. So uh, the wizards, we're going to use purple for our wizard color. So that's our starting wizards living in the tower. Um, next, we uh, follow a series of steps where the wizard civilization grows and changes and builds and alters this landscape. This is the landscape that will eventually build up into your dungeon. So the first thing we do is we expand the wizard's population by adding another bead. I'm just going to add some balconies to this tower and have this second wizard live upstairs. And I'm going to make a note in these rules about something that could be more clear, since this is a playtest. So the wizards, uh, their civilization is founded on magic, and how their magic works is they summon spirits, oni, jinn uh, of some sort to do their bidding. To do this, they need a summoning stone. So I'm going to draw my summoning stone. I'll keep it in purple, because that's my wizard civilization cover color. In this case... My summoning stone is just going to be a big slab of stone in a clearing. And each turn of the game, the wizards summon a spirit at the stone. Then they use this spirit to build constructions. So, following the wizard life cycle, they explore towards resources that have not previously been exploited. So resources for wizards are almost everything. Magma, gems, water, uh, this weird thing. So I think um, we'll start with the gems because they're sort of easily accessible. So we'll say, we'll just build some tunnels into the mountain here where the dwarves, uh, dwarves, the magicians have tunneled in to get all of these gems. If the magicians have discovered any new, re new resources, build the appropriate magician construction. So, when the magicians discover gems, they can build an orrery, uh, which is an above-ground construction, or an umphalos, which is a below-ground construction. Uh, let's build an orrery, because orreries are cool. So we're going to put our orrery in a cool tower-like building. Like so. This uses up the gems. So we'll put a room here and show that those gems have been mined out and exploited. Constructing an orrery also consumes the spirit, so it's simply removed. Now we'll go through turns a bunch of times like this and sort of build up our own kind of unique uh, magician civilization. So we go back to the beginning, the magicians expand. Let's build another wizard tower for some more wizards to live in. Let's make this one a little taller. And slender. Then the wizards summon a djinn, and they go looking for resources. Um, let's have them tunnel down to this magma, but how I'm going to do it is I'm actually going to come down and build a spiral staircase down through these limestone caves. And here the magicians tunnel down to the magma. With magma, we can build a cyclop forge or an alchemist's foundry. I think we're going to build a foundry. And I'm going to make a note. 
out here. Now, when the magicians build a foundry, a foundry does not require a gin to be consumed, but the magicians have to do something with that gin, so um, they will build a vault to store it in. I guess they can use these limestone caves that they've already discovered. Let's um, seal this vault with a magic circle to keep the evil spirit inside. And now we continue, we'll continue to expand this civilization. Let's build. Another wizard dwelling. Oh, I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> Pardon me. So, summon a gin. We uh, keep looking for resources to exploit. Let's tunnel into the sea with water. We can build a fountain of the naiads or a magical aqueduct. Um, I kind of like, um, I don't know, I'm torn. You know what, I'm actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to build a magical aqueduct, and I'm going to build it to the foundry, because I think the magicians are using that water to power some kind of magical industry at the foundry related to their... Um, ultimate plans, whatever they may be. Uh, what do the magicians want? Why are they building all this stuff? That's kind of for you to decide. So uh, that construction uses up the gin, so we'll simply remove it. Now, this doesn't go on forever. Eventually, the magician's civilization will reach a point where their civilization comes to an end. The rules for that say, uh, if there are seven or more vaults, then the imprisoned gin rise up and destroy the magician civilization. If there are seven or more magicians, then the magicians achieve their goal, whatever it may be, and depart this world for uh, other realms. Um, this civilization is clearly heading towards the seven wizards direction. Uh, but let's keep playing it out and see how it goes. So, let's expand our wizard dwellings. Bring in another wizard, summon a djinn, and then seek other resources to exploit. Um, I think this is where they're going to go. Now, there's a limit to how far the wizards can tunnel in one turn. It's a bit of a judgment call. It's like, say, about the length of your finger. So I'm going to say they can't tunnel far enough to get to this in one turn. So this is kind of an incomplete construction. But that means they don't have another resource to mine, so they can't build anything this turn. So that means they still have to deal with this magical creature, so they will seal that away in a vault as well. And then we continue. Let's um, make this into kind of a tall ziggurat and put another magician in it. We'll summon a djinn and we'll continue our tunnel.
So uh, this skull is a special feature called a nexus. So in Hot Host a Dungeon, you can get all different kinds of nexuses. It's not always a giant buried skull. It could be an alien brain, uh, a deposit of magical energy, uh, all kinds of weird stuff. So when the wizards encounter a nexus, what do they build? Uh, a Lyceum Arcanum. So this can be above ground or below ground, and I'm definitely going to put this... Actually, maybe I'll put it in these caverns. So, this is really going to convert this. I don't know what a Lyceum Arcanum looks like. I'm just going to kind of base it on the Colosseum in Rome, I guess. It's an underground Colosseum. Where wizards, magicians, debate and argue. Mm, that does not consume a creature, so we need to fault away another one of these beasties. So, uh, the wizard population is at six. So they're almost at their final point. Let's build another wizard tower here. So, one, we add a magician. Two, a djinn at the summoning stone. Then we explore in search of resources. Um, I think that uh, this silver ore is the next thing that the magicians can make use of. So they will dig a shaft here, seeking it, but incomplete. Um, if the magicians have discovered any new resources, build the appropriate construction. They have not. Otherwise, build a vault. So they build a vault to store away this creature. Sealed with magical runes. Finally, if there are seven or more magicians, build Diaspora and the civilization ends. So Diaspora just means a scattering of population. So the wizards leave this land and um, head to parts unknown. Uh, I'm gonna leave. So when you when you build, sometimes you you build something that's kind of more of an event than an actual thing. But it's cool if you can leave something on the map. So I'm just gonna build this obelisk, which is inscribed with the secrets of the magicians and why they left this plane of reality and where they went and what they hoped to achieve there. So end of the civilization. Um, this needs another note. We remove the wizard civilization population. The djinn go away. The volcano erupts. The rules don't say that. I'm just deciding because the rules do say that the magician civilization ends in a cataclysm and is buried. So I will take this color, which is my surface line, and I will draw a new surface. Let's make this mountain thicker too because it's just erupted and buried this civilization in magma and lava. Like so. And then we move on to the next phase of the game, which is the Age of Monsters. And how I like to do that is to just cover my page with some tracing paper so that I can draw my new era on top, but still see what features are there from the previous era. How to Host a Dungeon is very much a game of change and transformation and layers to create a world.
very carefully. Don't cut myself. So I think I'm pretty happy with that playtest. I think the Magician Civilization went pretty smoothly. How the Magician Civilization differs from some of the other civilizations is, for example, the Dwarven Civilization builds a lot. They build a lot of uh, treasure vaults and dormitories and kind of identical rooms. So they kind of sprawl much larger. They build a bigger dungeon. But the Magician Civilization, while it's smaller, almost every construction has some character, right? You've got your orrery, your foundry, your your Lyceum, and so on. So um, it kind of just gives a little bit of a different flavor to your world. All right, so now we're starting a new age. I'm going to draw the new surface of the world. A rugged mountain range. Some ancient ruins, I guess, where these towers used to be, with entrances to dungeons beneath. And I guess now cliffs leading down to the sea. All the stuff that's underground is still there. I just don't draw it in until some monster discovers it or something happens there that makes it significant. Because when I draw it in, it may look a little different because time has passed. In the same way that I drew these towers now as ruins, this is an opportunity to remake your world as it has changed. Uh, I'm also going to redraw the forests, which have come back in the wake of the volcanic eruption. I guess you can't see that green super well. Maybe I can find a marker that'll, um, here, let's go over here and use this one. And now, the Age of Monsters. How do we do this Age of Monsters again right? Okay, so, in the Age of Monsters, a number of monsters will come and move into this dungeon and make their own. I've got a big stack of monster cards here. You can see they've got all kinds of handwritten scrawl on them because I've been editing and modifying these a lot lately. I'm going to start by choosing three of them and bringing them into my world. All right, let's just cut this and choose. So we're going to start with the Order of Starhelm, troglodytes, and a dinosaur. I'm going to put some numbers on this map to indicate the various areas where monsters can appear. So the surface is number one. I'll redraw these lines that separate the zones or stratum. The wizard ruins are two. The mountain is three. The magma chamber. The nexus of bone. The silver vein. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10. Very convenient number. So I'm just checking the order of Starhelm to see if they spawn on the surface, like the other knightly order that is one of my monsters, but they don't. So let's roll for a random stratum for them to spawn in. They spawn deep underground. Well, they're a knightly order, but they're not necessarily a knightly order of humans. They could be... Um, some subterranean they're they're lawful good so i don't know what kind of lawful good creature 
would spawn deep underground. But um, we're going to draw some dungeon rooms for them to start out in. And we'll use yellow for them. I don't know if anybody has an idea for a lawful good monster that might spawn deep underground and seek to rid the world of undead. Uh, I am open to suggestions. So, the Order of Starhelm, uh, it's it's a special, unique monster, and they seek to destroy undead. When they appear in the game, you immediately go looking for an undead monster to add if you don't have any undead in your game, which we don't. So I'm just going to go through this and grab the first undead monster I come across. The Fiend is not undead. Maybe it should be. I'll think about that. And we get a vampire. Vampire will spawn in zone number two. The vampire spawns in the old wizard dwellings. Is it a cursed wizard who was forced to stay behind when his people left? Could be. Anyway, let's put him in one of these. Uh, if there's a tomb near where the vampire spawns, they spawn on the tomb. We have no tombs in this game yet. If it doesn't mark its spawning location as a tomb, so this is now... A tomb. Actually, you know, I'm not going to use purple because this is no longer wizard territory. I'm going to use black for my rooms now. And let's use black for the vampire. I'm going to expand his cozy lair because he needs room for his treasures because the Vampire is quite rich. So, in the Age of Monsters, colored beads represent monster population, and white beads represent their treasures, whatever those treasures may be. For a vampire, um, lost magical lore and treasures of the wizard civilization. So, I mean, if this is your D&D world, then you've got a world full of mysterious runes that uh, their purpose long forgotten. And then you have this vampire who, who maybe was alive when the wizards were around, who maybe knows the whole thing, right? So uh, maybe this is a monster that a party of adventurers would go seek out and kill and have an adventure. Or maybe he's someone you have to consult with. Maybe you have to offer him something that he wants in order to discover a secret of the wizard civilization. I like that idea. Now we spawn our dinosaur. Our dinosaur is going to, let's see, dinosaurs spawn on the surface or an underground biome only. So dinosaurs only spawn in biomes. We have no underground biomes on this map. So the dinosaur is just going to spawn on the surface. Uh, we're just going to put him in the forest. There he is. And the troglodytes uh, never spawn on the surface. And they are also spawning in zone 10. So, um, under uh, during the game when monsters spawn in the same location they fight but not I don't do that in the opening phases so let's draw a troglodyte dungeon here as well let's just call that the trog dungeon and let's call this the good dungeon Draw some troglodyte huts here. And a little treasure room for their treasure. Let's do troglodytes as green. Okay, and now each of these monsters takes their turn, which is just a list of things that they automatically do or can do in the course of a turn. So, troglodytes always exploit, or if there's some available, this is a very fortunate place for them to have appeared because there is ore here for them to mine. So now we're going to draw 
a troglodyte mine and that will give them some treasure and they will need a treasure room to put it into. Uh, then if their population is low, they can add population, but it is not. And they have a number of options that they can do. I think they're going to just breed and add to their population. So currently a pretty prosperous troglodyte tribe. Next we have the dinosaur. Uh, dinosaurs always hunt denizens. Uh, so dinosaurs basically kill and eat anyone they can find. The vampire is not a denizen though, he's what's called an alpha predator. In fact, both these monsters are alpha predators, which means they're more powerful monsters, much harder to kill. And uh, in this case, they, uh, well, let's see, let's see what the rules. So the uh, dinosaurs always hunt. Um, if there's nothing for them to hunt, then they relocate. So the dinosaur is basically just gonna wander the surface looking for things to hunt. Then he has some choices. He can scout. He can route, attempt to route other alpha predators, so basically driving out competition. Um, I'm not going to have him do that yet. He could try and drive out this vampire, but I don't really see them being competition, so he's just going to scout and keep on wandering a short distance up the mountainside looking for prey. Maybe later we will have a conflict between these two. Let's see what happens. So the Order of Starhelm hunts undead. There are no undead at their location, so they're going to go looking for them, uh, which I guess means they're going to just dig some dungeon tunnels. And um, I'm going to give them a cave here in which to build a camp. So the Order of Starhelm are basically wanderers. They wander the world seeking undead to fight. Now, uh, what else do they do? They could fight these troglodytes, and that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, troglodytes aren't evil, per se, but... So, we'll roll um, a green die for the order, and a black die for the troglodytes. And neither of these has a special advantage, so it's just a straight-up roll-off. And um, the troglodytes win, so a knight is killed. Let's draw a little memorial for him. And finally, the vampire takes a turn. Uh, always hunt for denizens that have blood. There's no one for him to prey upon at this time. If I am in danger of being driven out by a strong monster group, relocate. Hmm. Well, the vampire could be driven out uh, by the dinosaur. This is an opportunity for the vampire to move his lair to a safer location. Um, and I think he's actually gonna gonna do that. So we'll draw in these tunnels and he's gonna take up residence in the the old Lyceum. So an underground Colosseum inhabited by a mysterious old man who seems to know an awful lot about the wizard civilization. Perhaps more powerful than he seems to be. And surrounded by ancient books and treasures of that civilization. All right, and then the last thing that happens in any turn is a new monster spawns. Uh, we don't do that. Actually, do we do that on the first turn of the game? Sure, why not? We can always use more monsters. So, the Demonic Horde. Actually, I'm not going to use the Demonic Horde because um, I want to use something that hasn't been in any of my playtests yet. So I'm, I'm just going to go and grab the first monster here that I have not yet playtested. Um, these guys have not been in any of my playtests recently. The Morlons, an ancient neutral, uh, sorry, an alien neutral monster group. The Morlons will appear in zone number 10. 
So I guess coming up from deep underground, these guys are going to move into the caves that the order vacated. Now called the Morlon dungeon. Let's um, mark these with triangles for some reason. And then the Morlons take their turn. Um, they always explore, which I think means they investigate these tunnels and find their way to where the Order and the Troglodytes are in a standoff, which means these groups now all know about each other and can interact. Um, the Morlons like magma. It's very useful to them. So... Um, I am going to have them continue to explore each turn if possible until they find the magma, and then they can relocate there. I don't think they know where the magma is yet. So they can build defenses, and that's exactly what they're going to do. So uh, I guess I'm going to just kind of make a guard room here, right, with murder holes and the rest of it. And then we just put this little chevron mark to show that it's a defense, which means these guys now get plus one if someone tries to attack them. And as simple as that. Now put these together, shuffle them up, and find out what happens next turn. And first we'll have the Morlons acting again. So they will continue their exploration in search of magma. Through these strange bone caves. here. They already have defenses, so they can't build it again. Maybe they need a fight move. I'm just going to think about that. They don't currently have one, so um, there really isn't much that they can do. But that's fine. They're safe behind their defenses. Next, the vampire. He still has no one to prey upon. Um, so he is going to prepare. Prepare is a generic move that uh, gives a monster what's called a bonus token. This just gives them a bonus if someone attacks them later. You know, some monster groups can trade in their bonus token for cool constructions, like uh, the wizard monster actually gathers bonus tokens by exploiting magic on the map and builds, you know, laboratories and cool wizardy stuff. For his preparation, I'm actually going to draw a tunnel leading into this old Jin prison. So the Jin is long gone, but um, perhaps the magical wards can be exploited by this vampire to strengthen his position. The dinosaur continues to wander, continues to hunger for bigger prey. The troglodytes will continue to mine out these ore pockets and add to their home base. Interesting how in this game sometimes some odd corner of the dungeon becomes the most interesting part of the game, unexpectedly. Um, I think they're probably feeling pretty tough. I think they're then going to fight the order that has been giving them trouble previously. So green die is the troglodyte die. And the troglodytes lose soundly, so a troglodyte dies. And finally, the order. Continuing their quest for undead. 
Okay, we'll expand the dungeon. Let's uh, connect up this dungeon to the rest. And then they relocate. So we'll just build them a new camp up here. Then we add a new monster. Wolves. So uh, let's see where they spawn. Area number three, the mountain. So uh, you might wonder why are wolves spawning underground? Well, in Dungeons and Dragons, you can find canine creatures all over the place. If wolves spawn near magma, they are hellhounds. If they spawn near a magical nex nexus, they're blink dogs, and so on. Um, I guess these are just like cave wolves. Maybe they're maybe they're wargs. But I'm just gonna I'm gonna kind of draw a cave here where these two lava channels meet. This is the birth birthplace of the wargs, who I will represent using red tokens. Wolves, uh, kind of like the order, are a monster that always wanders, so we'll have them wander to the surface and emerge onto the world. Then they seek for prey. Uh, but there's nothing for them to prey upon. So they have a number of options. One of them is to breed, so we'll add to their numbers. And that's the whole turn. Kind of a quiet one. But as the game gets more crowded, it will heat up more. So, more loans go first. Uh, more loans always explore. Um, they can relocate to move closer to a source of magma because. Um, as a group, uh, magma is a resource that they are good at exploiting, as we'll probably see in a future turn. So let's build some new spaces for them. I just received a text uh, letting me know that I'm going to get an important phone call here. So there will probably be a pause in the stream here momentarily probably hopefully just a, just a few minutes next the wolves so uh, the wolves will automatically relocate they can't prey upon the dinosaur it's just too tough for them to fight so um, I guess they will continue to scout these are cave wargs so they can scout underground so they move into this abandoned vampire dwelling we really need something up here for all these monsters to prey upon. Uh, the dinosaur, however, can prey upon the wolves. So um, being an alpha predator, he doesn't have to roll dice or anything. He just eats some wolves. Uh, and then he wanders away. The Order of Starhelm, <coughs> they hunt undead. They haven't yet found this vampire, so he gets a little bit of a stay of execution. With nothing to hunt, they relocate in search of undead, so I think they're going to head up this ancient shaft left by the magician civilization and blunder uh, right into the vampire's lair. I imagine this as this Order of Knights coming into this uh, ancient, abandoned, 
underground wizard arena where this old vampire man lives surrounded by his books. Uh, perhaps in the first encounter, they don't know that he's a vampire. They certainly will next turn, but let's see what happens in the meantime. The troglodytes. The troglodytes can mine ore every turn. So let's expand the ore mines through this area and add some treasure. When the troglodytes have three treasure, they can build an idol. So they will. Let's build it at this crossroads where they fought many battles with the Order of Starhelm. I'm not particularly good at drawing idols, but I'm just going to draw like a big kind of tiki statue thing. Tiki inspired, perhaps. So that consumes the bulk of their treasure, but it gives them a bonus token. And finally, the vampire. Um, well, he can actually prey upon the wolves or the Order of Starhelm, I think. A knight uh, disappears in the night. Then he can relocate. If he's in danger of being driven out by a stronger monster group, he can relocate to another location. Um, Well, this is going to get interesting, but I think he is he's going to do that. He slays a knight in his sleep and then flees to this ancient cavern. Which has a massive metal seal on the ancient wizard uh, engine, which connected to the magma chamber below. The holding pens, which once imprisoned ancient djinn, are now empty. And then a new monster enters the game. Uh, I'm just setting the demonic horde aside. It has come up in every single game that I have played since I started playtesting version 2, and I'm just... it's. A fine group, but I want to try some of the other stuff. Dwarves! Good old-fashioned dwarves. The dwarves appear in zone 4, uh, which is the limestone caverns. Now, I could have them uh, appear on top of the Order or the Vampire and fight them, but there's lots of room in this level, so I'm actually going to have the dwarves set up shop in this cavern over here. Uh, I'm going to use blue for the dwarves as well. So I'm just going to kind of build... Uh, this is a dwarf fortress in this cavern. And let's have some underground chambers, too, so they have enough room. Dwarves. Um, dwarves can export, exploit mineable resources. There are none right where they are, but then they can explore, so I think they're going to... Um, dig a mining tunnel to these gem deposits so that they can mine them out next turn. And that's their turn. Wolves. 
wolves relocate. Um, they could go deeper underground, but there's all kinds of creatures down there already, so I think I'm just going to head them back up to the forest. Uh, then they can prey upon a creature at their new location. Well, um, I think this turn they don't get to kill anybody. Um, what else can they do? They can ally with some kinds of groups. They can breed, but not above three. So, yeah, I think for now... Oh, uh, they... Sorry, four. They can breed up to a population of four, and they did lose a population, so they will breed. Dwarves. Dwarves mine out gems. Which gives them more treasure to store in their vaults. Yeah, I think that's sufficient for their turn. The dinosaur will wander back here. I need a wolf. The Order of Starhelm. Order of operations is important here. The first thing they do is they hunt undead. If the vampire was at their location, they could just kill it now. Uh, then they go searching for undead. So we will they'll pursue the vampire, and then their turn ends. Next turn, the vampire is not gone yet, so he is going to be able to kill another member of the order. Uh, if they went in the other order, then uh, which might happen next turn, then the order will kill the vampire. Troglodytes. They're going to just continue mining out this wonderful silver vein that's working out so well for them. I think they're perfectly happy to just live in their corner of the dungeon, increase their treasure and increase their numbers, if no one's going to give them any trouble. Now, the vampire kills another knight. And then relocates, but where's he going to go? He's running out of room. I guess, since he seems to know everything about the vanished magician civilization, he'll find the ancient ruined remains of this foundry and this obelisk with the wizard's secrets inscribed on it. He's going to need a little bit more room, so I guess he's going to... I think the orrery is in ruins now. Perhaps a party of adventurers could have a quest to go to the ancient magician or re, uh, retrieve the parts or repair it in order to avert some great world-altering catastrophe. But for now, it is the abode of a vampire and nothing else. And finally, the Morlons. The Morlons have found their source of magma, which means they can build a magma refinery. Let's build it right out here on an island in this magma lake. Um, I don't know really what a magma refinery looks like. I imagine this is some kind of factory where they um, pull raw materials out of the magma in order to drive their industry. Let's label that refinery. Um, they also always explore, so I guess they're going to kind of come up into the interior of this massive buried skull, whatever it is, and kind of just explore that and get to know that territory. Maybe they even find this place where the magicians were here previously. Now that they have a magma refinery, next turn they can start harvesting magma and creating treasures. So we've got two monster groups here that are kind of ensconced, maybe three, and doing pretty good. We'll see what happens to disrupt their operations. A giant pike. When a 
giant pike spawns, place it in the nearest water area. If none exists, you can create a new water-filled cavern at the spawn location. So, let's see. He appears in area number three, um, which is up here. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to put him in the underground river. It just makes a little bit more sense. You know, that's the thing about a solo game. If you don't follow the rules, it's not like you're cheating. It's just you. So we'll have him in this underground river. Spawns a massive predator with a pile of gold in his belly. All right, I see it's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to take a five-minute break. I'll be right back. Whoa, I got raided while I was away. 
Rigoroga, thank you again. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you waited till I was away. Get me from get me from secret. That's awesome. Thank you for stopping by. Looks like you brought a couple people with you. So I'm just uh, about halfway through a game of how to host a dungeon here. Sorry. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what's going on. So we've got uh, we've got a volcano dungeon today. We've got a buried magician civilization. We've got a vampire who has been fleeing from an order of undead hunting knights who are now down to only one surviving member. Uh, things started down here with these, these troglodytes, these knights, uh, the morlons all kind of spawned down here on this silver vein, but then they scattered and now the troglodytes are building up a nice base. The morlons are building up a nice base. The dwarves are building up a nice base. We've got a dinosaur and some wolves wandering this forest, uh, eating whoever emerges from the underground. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting, interesting point right now. So I'm just about to start another turn and find out what happens next. So how have things been going? Uh, wolves. Wolves wander. These are cave wargs that uh, evolved in this volcanic vent, so they're perfectly happy to wander underground, um, which they do. And I think they hunt down and kill the last of the knights before he can take out the vampire. Yeah, this knight, uh, these knights and this vampire, they had, they had some dicey turns where whichever one went first would wipe out the other, but the vampire whittled down their numbers and managed to survive. The Morlons. The Morlons have a magma refinery and access to a magma chamber, which means they can now refine valuable metals every turn, increasing their treasure. Uh, also, they continue to explore the dungeon. There's this massive buried skull that they've already explored, and now they've found these old wizard tunnels that lead into the main dungeon where they can encounter other monsters. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we have a giant pike living in this underground river. Since there's nothing for him to hunt at his current location, he just kind of wanders down the river to where it meets the main dungeon. Um... Nothing really for him to hunt there either, so we'll move on. The dinosaur. The dinosaur, having nothing on the surface to hunt for now, will just continue to wander, looking for something to eat. The order has been wiped out. And the dwarves. So in this ancient volcanic cinder cone, there are some uh, gem deposits that were, I don't know, perhaps ejected by the volcano at some point, so the dwarves are going to continue to tunnel towards the gem deposits so that they can mine those out on the next turn. Uh, they can build too at this point, so I think they will. They'll expend some of their treasure to build a war machine. which they will keep in this cavern. I don't know if you can tell, but I guess that's a giant drill of some sort. The war machine gives them a bonus token for future conflicts. I'm just kind of tearing along at full speed ahead here today to see to see what happens and what I can get done. Uh, these troglodytes, they will continue to mine out this rich silver vein and increase their treasure. They also have a an idol that they built which gives them their bonus their bonus token. This dungeon's kind of in a building phase right now. There was some a lot of fighting early on, but now it's quieted down. Um, the vampire has explored this whole cave system so he knows everything that's going on in it. He will 
Not his preference, but he will hunt for wolves. Uh, and he can also bribe the dinosaur, perhaps um, with meat? I don't know, but he's, he's actually going to attempt to do that. So he's going to expend some of his uh, resources, and we're going to roll dice. And he is uh, successful. The dinosaur goes away and leaves him alone. And then we'll add another monster. An ogre mage. The ogre mage moves into level one. He moves into the surface. Okay. Well, there's really... The only place I see an ogre mage living on the surface is he refurbishes this ruined wizard's tower back to its former glory. Let's use a green token for the ogre mage, and he has some treasure. So ogre maids, mag, mages can hunt. There's no one for him to hunt with. Um, he can actually, uh, if there's nothing for him to hunt, he trades with the nearest po powerful monster. He could, I mean, he could trade with the dinosaur. I'm not quite sure what that looks like. I guess this Tyrannosaurus is kind of smart enough to know when he's been bribed, but I think he's gonna he's gonna trade with the vampire. I think that makes sense. I'm going to check my rules for how trading works and make sure I do it right because I haven't done that move since I revised the rules a little bit. So, trade. The active monster approaches the target with an offer of trade. If successful, the active group gains one treasure and the target gains one bonus token. Otherwise, the active group transfers one to the target if available. Um, okay. It occurs to me that's not a great deal, so maybe I'll maybe I'll rewrite that. I'm just going to make a note. So trade is still a conflict. See who gets the best deal. So the ogre mage will roll the green die, and the vampire will roll the black one. And it is a tie. Uh, normally, the active group wins the tie, but uh, the vampire has a bonus token, which gives it plus one to the roll. So the bonus token is used up. I guess that's, you know, some of the um, magical lore that the vampire accumulated in exploring the magician caves. And um, yeah, so the vampire gets the best of the deal. And the ogre mage is left grumpy. Um, well, he gets another action, and he can actually extort, uh, but only from lawful or good groups. Which raises the question, is the vampire lawful? And he is not, so the ogre mage cannot extort from the vampire. The vampire just laughs at him. So um, I guess he'll scout which I think just means he investigates the deeper dungeons underneath this tower that he has decided to call home. <laughs> yes, those vampires and their exploitative tendencies. The vampire is kind of an interesting monster group because they, they have a way to mess with almost anybody. They can uh, recruit undead to their cause. They can hunt lesser groups that they can feed from, and they can um, uh, they have a couple of tricks that they can pull on, on alpha predators as well. So, yeah. Vampires are trouble. Really, a vampire's worst enemy is the Order of Starhelm, because they can kill undead without rolling dice. But uh, the vampire managed to dodge that bullet and defeat the Order, so he's looking pretty. All right, Morlons. Morlons love to explore. 
So uh, I think in this case, since the Morlons already have explored this area, and they've explored to here, it just means that they continue to come up here until they see these um, ancient magician caverns, uh, which means uh, in the parlance of this game, the Morlons can interact with the wolves because they've found the wolves, but the wolves have not come down here, so I think the wolves probably can't hunt the Morlons. Yeah, a dinosaur as a hunting dog would be would be pretty awesome. Um, uh, ogre mages can recruit humanoids. Uh, ogres actually can recruit animals, and dinosaurs are animals, so an ogre could actually be riding around on that Tyrannosaurus Rex using him as a mount, which um, would be a pretty awesome adventure, although my players would probably say I was being completely unfair, which uh, might be true. It wouldn't stop me, though. All right, the Morlons explore more magma to create more treasure. Uh, I think uh, they will then build some defenses since they now know there are powerful monsters afoot. I think their defenses, let's build a defensible door here at this confluence of tunnels. And we'll just put this mark here to show that it is a defense. That gives them plus one if someone chooses to attack them. Uh, next, the Ogre Mage. He still doesn't have anyone to hunt. Um, and he has no one to recruit. He's not really under any danger from that dinosaur. I think he is going to try and rout the vampire. He's going to try and drive the vampire out of his lair. So vampires are pretty powerful monsters in how to host it because they have a lot of good options. They have one weakness though, which is if they are driven out of their lair, they die. So uh, this dice roll could end the vampire. Let's find out. Uh, it does not. The vampire wins that conflict. Um, there's no consequences to losing a route, unfortunately, so the ogre mage could try again. Let's see what the vampire does about it when his turn comes along. Dwarves. The dwarves will build another mine site here and mine out some more of these ancient gems. Troglodytes can mine out the last of this silver vein, exhausting the silver mines. and collecting one more treasure. Giant Pike. Well, um, since the Morlons have reached this point, the Pike can, um, can hunt Morlons, I think. I think some incautious Morlons exploring this area, uh, gathering dungeon moss or something is eaten by the giant pike. Um, and I think that's it. I think maybe the pike needs some more options. I'm just going to make a note to... Every time I play this, I find three or four things I want to do on these, these monster cards. Updating these monster cards is the biggest, biggest part of game development on this right now. So the vampire. Uh, first, he hunts for denizens, which means he consumes a wolf. If he's in danger of being driven out by a strong monster group, relocate. So he could now relocate his lair away from the ogre magi to a safer spot. Um, I wonder, he could also bribe the ogre mage to leave him alone, or he could prepare uh, magic etc. to get a bonus token to help conflict with the... I think he's going to try and bribe the Ogre Mage. I think that's a little more interesting than him because he's had to relocate a bunch of times to get away from the Order, and I, I don't think he wants to do it again. So let's dice it off. Uh, but he fails. The Ogre Mage takes his treasure, but continues to conspire against him. These two are going to be nasty rivals. 
um, the wolves. Wolves always relocate. I think these wolves are going to go deeper into the dungeon because um, the surface hasn't been great for them. Um, and then I think they are going to um, I think they're going to breed. Their numbers are low. They need a buffer. And finally, the dinosaur who just wanders the surface looking for denizens to prey upon um, because the ogre mage and the vampire are too powerful for him to take on. Oh, and then we need a new monster group. The Syndicate. The Syndicate is a criminal organization that takes up residence in the dungeon. So let's find out where they're setting up their base first. On the surface, interesting. Okay, well, I think in that case, these must be pirates. who have set up a pirate base here on the shore. So uh, I'm imagining this kind of rickety Tortuga town rising from the cliffs with gambling, trade, smuggling, ruled over by this band of cruel, exploitative pirates. Um, to their dismay, they find that this land is inhabited by dinosaurs, so this could be a really short stay for them. But let's see what they can do. Um, they always fight uh, denizens that have attacked them in the past, which that hasn't happened yet because they're new to these lands. Um, they can bribe alpha predators, so I guess they're just going to feed the the dinosaurs. I mean, hey, it's useful to have uh, uninhabitable dinosaur forests at your back as long as the dinosaurs. Uh, they totally fail at that. Uh, and thus the dinosaur acquires some treasure. Now, funnily enough, animals don't carry treasure, so when the dinosaur wanders away to leave that treasure lying there, and then the syndicate could pick it up again, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. In fact, I need to make a note of that because that uh, that rule needs to be added to the main rule book. Okay. Wolves. Cave wolves go deeper into the dungeon. Um, they can only hunt creatures that they outnumber for. They are a cautious and cowardly lot. So I guess they will breed in hopes of eventually being able to compete with some of the monster groups that live down here. I could have rolled randomly to see which direction they wandered. Probably I should have. Maybe I will next turn. Dinosaur. Dinosaurs always wander. Um... You know, I'm, the dinosaur is allowed to scout, so uh, I'm going to say, you know, there's no reason that there can't be some form of dinosaur that can't explore these underground ruins a little bit. The Syndicate. Um, the Syndicate does best when they have someone to extort. Uh, which they do not have here. They can explore looking for new customers. So I guess we'll just, um, I'm just going to build a little hut here. Just this is, uh, shows how far 
syndicate exploration teams have penetrated these jungles. They do, however, find some treasure left behind by the dinosaurs. I, my, my justification for this is they fed the dinosaurs meat, uh, which used up their stores, but they found dinosaur ivory, which is very valuable. So they're still in business. The trogs no longer have ore to exploit. So what are they going to do? Um, they can continue to breed, sure. I guess they will definitely do that. Um, if they get to the service, they can start cutting down trees and turn that into treasure, but that's a pretty long trip for them. So, I don't know, these guys may have settled into just a growing pattern. And perhaps they will grow enough to trigger the end of the Age of Monsters and then we will stop there. I guess the pike, can he keep hunting more lawns or wolves? Yeah, let's let's do it. One, two, three, four, five, six. He hunts more more lawns. Then the more lawns. So Morlons uh, adding new population is pretty hard for them, but okay. So let's let's first explore. I'm going to have them explore this way, to where they encounter the dwarves. Um, they can relocate to escape a powerful neighbor, but they don't want to leave their magma ra refinery behind. Well. I guess they'll just hang out for a while. The Ogre Mage can hunt denizens and recruit humanoids. The Syndicate are not necessarily humanoids, so he can't recruit them. Um, they are not lawful or good, so he can't extort from them. So I guess he's just going to hunt them. Tough luck for the syndicate. The dwarves explore to the last gem chamber, which they can mine next turn. The vampire. Uh, I'm sorry, syndicate, but these lands were just too perilous. Uh, their buildings fall into ruins. The port is abandoned. The ship becomes a shipwreck. Oh, and that's everybody. Now we spawn a new group. Yeah, so sometimes you spawn a group, they add something to the world, and then they disappear. It's that that simple. What do we get? Uh, St Order of Starhelm was killed. They can't return because they are a unique, a unique monster. So let's get a demigod. I've never had a demigod before. When a demigod spawns, roll twice on this list to determine its tags. So the demigod is some kind of half-divine creature. We'll need an eight-sided die to find out what this demigod's story is. So the demigod is a giant, chaotic demigod. Okay who lives in layer 10. Let's use a black. Demigod enters play with a bonus token representing its divine heritage. So I guess up from deep beneath the earth where the Morlons first entered the world comes this demigod. And in fact, I think we're going to we're going to have an invasion. He's going to claim this level of the dungeon for himself or try to so this is a straight up dice off. The demigod gets plus one because he has a bonus token. His divine magic is used up, but the troglodytes are driven out of their home. I'm just gonna create an escape route and forced to live in caverns on and in the river. 
Troglodytes have the aquatic tag, which means that they can live in water as easily as they can on land. So they have fled into the river and hid their treasure of silver in the riverbed. This is now all the god dungeon. Uh, they get to keep their bonus token though because they lost the fight. So their god has not abandoned them. This god has just moved in and taken over. And then the demigod takes his turn. Demigods always get to generate a bonus token if they don't have one. Um, he is, let's write down, he is chaotic and is a giant. Um, he can recruit. He can hunt monsters that share no tags with him. So, uh, yeah, sure. He devours a wolf. He is a giant chaos, a chaos giant, a giant chaos giant, after all. Ogre Mage. Hmm. He doesn't really have very much to do. I guess he's going to trade with the vampire again. Why would the vampire agree to trade with him? Well, this is one of those adversarial kind of frenemy. Uh, I almost imagine these two getting together somewhere deep in the magician caves and like playing chess on a regular basis and making outrageous bets and telling preposterous stories. Uh, this time he succeeds. So uh, he gets more treasure, but it's a good trade. So um, the vampire gets a bonus token as well. So uh, I imagine the Ogre Mage maybe found something in the basement of this tower where he took up residence that to him is just a trinket of the Magician Age, but maybe to the Vampire was really useful. So this was a good trade for both. Now the Dwarves. The Dwarves mine out these gems, which gives them more treasure. With three treasures and a bonus token, the dwarves can build a wonder of the world. When the dwarves build a wonder of the world, well, first of all, let's figure out what that what that wonder is. I mean, I almost think like they rebuild the dwarven city or um, I don't know, maybe they like create a massive dwarven statue. My statues look so janky. Right? Like a dwarf with a massive axe astride the mountainside with a gate into their realm, which they then claim this mountain is their own. Why? Because when the dwarves successfully build a wonder, it triggers the end of the Age of the Monsters. The dwarves become the alpha villain for the next phase and try and conquer the world, and adventurers start arriving. Uh, the rules for this stage of the game are not yet complete, so I'm going to add this to my stack of maps that are ready to test for the villain phase, and maybe um, sometime very soon I'll have those rules. But that actually brings this playtest to a successful close. Uh, I'm sort of excited that that took an hour and a half because I've been trying to get the time required for this game. Usually it takes me two and a half to three hours to play a whole game of how to host a dungeon. And uh, it's it's easy to play longer if you if you want to, but it's kind of hard to play shorter. So I'm excited that this one went a lot faster. And I'm pretty happy with this dungeon too. This is pretty interesting and pretty fun story. So, which is my way of saying... Thank you for joining me for my How to Host a Dungeon playtest. Uh, I'm going to call this done and uh, go to work on editing a new copy of the rules so that I can get them posted online. If you want the rules to this game that I'm playtesting, you can find them on my Patreon, which I'm going to post 
the URL in the chat, patreon.com slash Tony Dowler. Which I will spell correctly. So hop over there and check out the rules, play a game, and let me know what you think. Thanks a lot. It's always so much fun to have company when I'm doing this. It gets me down here and gets me working and gets my creative juices flowing. So thank you all. You are helping me create how to host a dungeon. Have a good day.